Hello everyone, let's go over the um, linear functions test. Okay. Uh, first, plotting some points. I'll do this real quick. Not a lot of people uh, had problems with this, but I will talk about one thing. Uh, so we have three zero. Remember, don't mess up your x's and y's. Um, x is three, y is zero. x is negative five, y is negative six. x is two, y is three. x is negative two, x, uh, y is five. There we go. That's it. Then we're done. No more. We plotted the four points. It says plot the points. We plotted the points. Um, I saw some of this or uh, this or any number of connecting of the dots. Uh, and that's showing me that you aren't, uh, if, you, if you do know what a graph is, you're not thinking about it you're just thinking there are points you connect dots like but it's not a coloring book it is uh, it's a graph right and what does this graph consist of it consists of four points only okay um, we'll talk about why we connect points in other cases right? why do I connect points on number or whatever okay so we'll get there I'll explain why that is but that was just connect or just plot these four points that was it all right, so which point, this or this, is on the graph? Okay. Well, if it's on the graph, remember what a graph is? It's made of millions and billions and an infinity number of points. Then every point represents a solution to this equation. If there's a point right here, wherever that is, I haven't put any units there on purpose, it's at some x, y, right? That's, that's why we have the coordinate plane. We, we put points and they represent an x and a y. Where they're located represents two numbers, this number and this number, the input and the output of the function. If I input the x that I have here and the y that I have here, then the equation should come out to be true. It should be equal on both sides. Okay, Whatever I put on here for x and y, this side should be 3 because this, this side is 3 and comes out to be equal. Okay, That's what a graph is. That's what the points on the graph represent, solutions to the equation. So if this point is on the line, uh, or on the, the graph, say, say we don't know it's a line yet, but uh, say it's on the graph for this function, then the very definition of being a point on a graph is that your x and y coordinates uh, work in the equation, solve the equation, satisfy the equation, make the equation true. Okay, So let's try 2 times 7 halves, right? I plug that in for x, minus 2 over 3 times 3, plug that in for y, does that equal 3? That's the question. Uh, if you want, uh, just multiply straight across and, and then simplify. Right? And then start to notice every time I do that, like every time I do 14 over 2, it, well, that 2 just got multiplied by the 7. Why don't I just cancel the 2 to start with? It, whatever. It's all the same. Uh, 6 over 3. That's 2. That's 5. That is not equal to 3. That is not a solution. That's not a point on the graph. Let's try it for 11 halves comma 12. So 2 times 11 halves uh, minus 2 thirds times 12. Does that equal 3? Uh, the 2's cancel each other, or 22 over 2. We'll simplify to 11 anyway. Uh, minus, well, the 3 cancels with the 12. That leaves with a 4. Okay, 4 times 2, that's 8. 11 minus 8 is indeed equal to 3. So 11 halves comma 12 is a point on the line. All right, so I want you to complete the table and graph the function. All right, so uh, there's quite a few little mistakes, uh, you know, negatives getting mixed up, or I accidentally, 2 times 3 was 5 instead of what it should have been 6, or whatever, just small mistakes like that. Um, but let's go through each of these, uh, or at least a couple of them. Uh, so if this is x, I put that x in for x, and then I see what comes out, and that's my y. So negative 5 thirds times negative 6. I like to put that over 1 so that uh, it's easier to figure out. And the 3 cancels with the negative 6, leaving a negative 2. Negative 5 times negative 2 is 10 minus 1. That's 9. So that is my output there. OK, we do it again for negative 3. Negative 5 thirds times. Um, negative 3, I like to again put it over 1, 
Uh, the 3 cancel the negative 3, leaving a negative 1. Negative 5 times negative 1 is 5. Minus 1 is 4. Okay, 0 is way easy. You put 0 in there, you subtract 1, and you get negative 1. Okay, we plug in uh, positive 3, negative 5 thirds times positive 3 over 1, minus 1. Threes cancel, we get a negative 5 minus 1, we get negative 6. And lastly, number 6, negative 5 thirds times 6 over 1, minus 1. 3 cancels with a 6, leaving 2. Negative 5 times 2, negative 10, minus 1, negative 11. All right, then we plot those points. Negative 6, see negative 5, negative 6, comma 9. There we go. So you know which point it is. All right, now for this blue guy, negative three, comma four. One, two, three, four. Uh, this next one got mixed up a little bit. Sometimes zero is your x, so you don't go horizontally at all. You just stay here, and then you go down one. There were some negative one zeros uh, out there. So be careful of that. Put all the other points for good. So three, negative six. And 6, negative 11 it goes slightly off the graph to right there. Okay, now uh, a common mistake was uh, leaving it just like that. Just oh, that's it, that's the line. Or that's what I was asked to do, right? But it says graph the function. So let's talk about uh, what I was talking about, number one. Here we quote, connect the dots. Right. And you may want to tune me out when I'm talking about this, but if you don't, if you choose not to, the, it makes so much more sense. Okay. When we connect the dots, we're not just connecting the dots like we do in a coloring book, one, two, three, four, five. We are drawing the rest of the dots. Right? We've only plotted some of the points. Why did we plug in negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, and 6? Because those are the ones I gave you. I could have given you anything, but I was smart about it, and I gave you numbers that cancel the denominator. Who wants to deal with fractions, right? I don't want to plot points that are uh, fractions on the graph. It's just a, a hassle, right? I want to plot them right on these dots, right on the grid. Um, so I gave you those x values so you find some easy points, so we don't have to bother with all of the, the other weird points. But I don't know. Let me, let me show you what one of those weird points would be. Um, Let's say we went to x is um, 5. Okay, so we would have negative 5 thirds times 5 over 1. I like to put it over 1. Uh, we get negative 25 thirds minus 1. That's 3 thirds, right? Common denominator. Negative 28 thirds or negative 5 and 3. No, negative. Um, negative 9 and 1 third. Negative 9 and 1 third. All right, so go over 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That was the x we just plugged in. And then you go down to negative 9 and 1 third. So you go down to 9 and 1 third. All right, trying to guess where 1 third is, is it's kind of ridiculous. It's such a tiny graph to guess where 1 third is. But look where that landed us right in between these two points, which is right in line with other, all these other points. Right? Because this graph happens to be linear in nature, that means that all of its points line up in a straight line. I could graph all of these points, and after I'm done graphing all of these points, I will have a line shape. But rather than do that, rather than bother with putting in 5 and putting in negative 2 and negative 7 and all these things that are hard to plot, let's plot the easy points and then we will make a really great guess at where the rest of the points will be. All the rest of the points, right? I'm following all the points that would have been plotted here, all the points that would have been plotted here, all the points that would have been plotted here, right? This black thing is just a mushed up uh, infinite billion trillion points. That's what it is. And that's why we, quote, connect the dots we're not really connecting the dots, not really a line. It's really an infinite number of points that are so close together that there's no gaps in between them anymore. And now they're a line. All right, enough of that. You don't have to listen to me anymore about that. All right, the range of the function. 
I saw a lot of single numbers, which means you're still mistaking the range of a function for a range of a set of data. Okay. Um, the range of a set of data is different from a range of a function, and I know that's annoying that uh, scientists and mathematicians and other people use same words for different things, but it happens all the time, right? Uh, see the word, uh, now I can't think of a word that is it's the same word, but it means different things. Um, here's a funny word, cleave, okay? It has two different meanings. It could mean to like cling to, right, to just join together. It could also mean to separate, right? Like a cleaver, like a giant knife, a cleaver, if to cleave something would be to, to cut a part of it off from the rest. But it could also mean to hang on too tightly and, and to join together. This is what we call an autoantonym, uh, which is a word that is spelled exactly the same, but means you could have two different meanings that are exactly the opposite from each other. Antonyms are opposite meanings. And this is an autoantonym because it's the same spelling. So it's kind of a funny thing. But look, this word means two different things, and it means the opposite thing, which is uh, especially frustrating. So this word range, it means different things in different contexts. In this context, as I've said before, it means all of the outputs. What's the output? Well, y is usually out the output. x is usually the input. In any case, on a graph, the horizontal is the input axis, and the output axis is the vertical axis, and the output axis. Okay, What kind of outputs can this function give? Can this give a, an output of 11? Let me look at 11. There are no outputs here. No outputs. How about 10? Technically, no outputs. It's just below that. How about 0.5? I don't see any outputs here. All right. So, what kind of outputs can I get? It's just going to be a guess. I, I think that looks like uh, 1.2. Looks like about 1.2 is the, the, the smallest. What's, what's the biggest one? I don't know, about 9 point, say 8. 9.8. So, y is somewhere between there. y can have any value in between uh, 1.2 and 9.8. Here's a 7, that's in between that. There's a, Nine, that's in between those two. There's five, that's in between those two. There's five and a half, that's in between. So that's what a range is for a function. In mathematics, uh, when we're talking about functions, a range is all the outputs. And I know that science is, uses math a lot. And uh, when we talk about range, we, we mean that we would take the biggest uh, data point and subtract the smallest, and then the range would be big that range is, I know, but the range, that's why I'm asking this question over and over, range means all the outputs of a function. What are they? What's possible for this function to output? Okay? So we graph this function. Uh, whether you use slope-intercept form or you don't, uh, if you don't, if you don't use slope-intercept form, or you, I don't know, even if you do, you need to understand what a graph is. It's so important because we're going to be graphing things. There's going to be graphing all throughout mathematics. Through any mathematics you ever take, um, it's very likely that you're going to do some graphing. And any mathematics you take in, in high school, definitely you're going to do graphing. So there's no point in fretting it and, and being upset when a graph is on the paper and saying, I hate this. Just remember what a graph is. It's so simple. Okay, A graph is a bunch of points. How many? A million, billion, an infinite number of points. And each point represents an input and an output of this function, or a solution to this equation. Okay. So if I don't know, if I don't know what this graph looks like, if I forget about the slope-intercept form, that's fine. Let's just plug in some points and find out. All right, let's just make a little table. Always default to this. Never default to guessing at how to use the slope-intercept form. Never, ever, ever, ever do that. Always default back to the, the table. If you then are like, oh, yeah, okay, I, get the, I, I understand the slope-intercept form now, uh, then, then use it, okay? But... Uh, the first thing I always like to plug in for x is 0. This is the beginning of the slope-intercept form. Plug in 0 for x because so simple, right? 0 for x, it eliminates this term, plus nothing. There's nothing else here, so we also get 0 for y. So there's a point right there at the origin. That's our y-intercept. That is the first part of the slope-intercept form. OK, what, else should I, what should I plug in for x? Anything that's like the next number that's easy to plug in for x. Do I want to plug in a million? That's way too big. No, I can't. I wouldn't even be able to plot the y value that I, I couldn't plot the x value. 
right, just choose the next number that is the easiest to plug in for x. In this case, I would say it's 1. Plug in 1 for x, maybe negative 1, whatever you, whatever you like. Then we take negative 4 times 1, negative 4. That's it. 1 for x, negative 4 for y. 1 for x, negative 4 for y. Could I have plugged in a half? Could I have plugged in a quarter? Could I have plugged in a 3 fourths? Yes. Where would they land me? Somewhere between, in a straight line between these two. Okay? That's not always the case, but we have the, the advantage right now of being in a, uh, the mode of linear functions. They're all going to graph as lines. Okay? When we graph a graph right now, it's going to be lines. Unless I specifically tell you otherwise, it's going to be a line. That won't last forever. We're going to have other kinds of functions that graph in different ways. But everything's going to be in a straight line from there. Okay? That's why this guy right here tells us the slope of our line, how sloped it's going to be, right? For an x of 1, I'm going to go down 4. For an x of 2, I'm going to go down 8. For an x of 3, I'm going to go down 12. Right? Every step of 1x is going to get me down 4, right? Negative 4 over 1, that's our slope. Okay. Here we are, number 6. Determine whether each of these things is a solution. Same as question number 2, are these points on the graph? Exactly the same question. Okay, so for, let's call it part A, I should have labeled it A, that would have been helpful, but oh well. So is this a solution to this function, or to this equation? Well, I'm going to plug in the x and the y and find out. Okay, so the y is 3, you don't get, don't get turned around backwards. This is 3, so 3 goes here for y. 4 times negative 3 uh, plus 8. 3 equals negative 12 plus 8. 3 equals... Well, 8 minus 12 is not 3. This is not true, right? It was always a question of, are these things equal? And they're not. 8 minus 12 is negative 4. That's not 3. That's not a solution. So I say, not a solution. Uh, 2, 16. Let's try that. That's part B. 16 is y. Uh, 4 times 2 plus 8. Will this work out? That's the question. 16 equals 8 plus 8. Yes, it does work out. I don't think I need to go that far. 8 plus 8 is 16. Uh, now I need to find a new solution, something that works, something that works like this. This is a solution. Okay, so I can't use 216, but I can use anything else. You know, it's a really easy one. Plug in 0 for x. You get 8 for y. You know, it's another easy one. Plug in 1 for x. Uh, 8 plus 4, that's just 12. Okay, that's a simple one. Uh, can't use to how about negative one negative one that's negative one times four is negative four eight minus four is four right these are th I could come up with these all day long plug in something for x see what comes out for y that's a solution um, it would take a little bit longer if you try to guess x and y at the same time just plug in x and then find out what y is now you have a solution okay let's make it not a solution well when I put in zero I get out at eight right I don't get out seven so that's not a solution so that works just fine right Plug in an x that you do know, and you know what the y should be if you've already done that work, so change the y. Any other y will not work, so this will not be a solution. All right. What is the x-intercept of this equation? What does the x-intercept mean? If we look at a graph, that is atrocious. If we look at an x, or sorry, if we look at a graph of this function, the x-intercept is where it crosses the x-axis, okay? I would like to find out where it crosses the x-axis. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Where does it cross the x-axis? Well, it's simple enough to find out because I know when I'm on the x-axis, what is true all along the x-axis, y is 0. Right? I'm not up in here. I'm not down here. I'm right on the, right the x-axis, which means my y value is nothing. It's 0. So I plug in 0 for y, and what happens? It goes away. This term goes away. And I get 2x equals 12 and x equals 6, so the y, or sorry, the x-intercept is 6, 0. Right, go over to 6, don't go up at all, stay on the x-axis, put a point, that's your x-intercept. Same is true for the y-intercept. Along the y-axis, where is the y-intercept? Some here, 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 where is it? Well, all along the y-axis, x is 0. So I plug in 0 for x, I get negative 4, y equals 16, divide by negative 4 on both sides, y equals negative 4. So the y-intercept is 0, negative 4. Now if you put it 6 and negative 4, absolutely fine. x equals 6, x equals, uh, or sorry, y equals negative 4, great. 
technically the x-intercept is a point, so the point I would need to give in, in uh, you know, coordinate form to be technically correct, but I'm not trying to get you on a technicality. I'm trying to see if you understand what it, I'm asking. Um, so label the x and y-intercept, graph, uh, graph this line. This is great. This is a right after number 8, or, or, or sorry, 7 and 8, where I found x and y-intercepts. I do the exact same thing. To find the x-intercept, I put in a 0 for y, so I get 5x equals 10 and x equals 2. That's my y-intercept. Sorry, my x-intercept. My y-intercept puts 0 in for x. I get negative 2y equals 10, y equals negative 5. Those are two points on the line, and so the line can be finished up just like that. simple stuff and I said to label it so just give me a little bit of a hey that's the uh, x intercept that is the y intercept and re rewrite this rewrite this equation in slope intercept form this is something we really need to practice that's why we're doing it on Khan Academy uh, we need to get it looking like y equals mx plus b it just means get y by itself same question over here get y by itself when y is by itself and you have it written like this, something times x plus some number, it's in slope-intercept form, which you can then easily pick out the slope and the y-intercept from that. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides. And negative 4y equals negative 3x minus 8. Uh, then I'm going to divide both sides by negative 4. y equals, I could write it like this, is it technically be... Uh, correct, but it's asking me for the slope-intercept form. That's not slope-intercept form. It's got to be a number times x plus b. So I divide this by 4. I divide this by 4. Negative 4, technically. So negative 3 divided by negative 4 is positive 3 fourths. That's times x um, plus 2. 3 fourths x plus 2. y equals 3 fourths x plus 2. Find the slope and y-intercept of the graph with the equation blah, blah, blah. Well, what's the slope and y-intercept of this? Well, the slope of th is 3 fourths, the y-intercept is 2. When I get it in slope-intercept form, that's why it's called slope-intercept form, is because the slope and the y-intercept are super easy to find. So we get y by itself. All right, so uh, let's, we'll take it real slow. You can do it faster if you want, but I'm just going to subtract 2 thirds from both sides. So I get 1 third x on this side minus 2y equals negative 2 thirds. And I'm going to subtract 1 third x. Negative 2y equals negative 1 third x minus 2 thirds. Uh, divide by negative 2. y equals. How do I divide negative 1 third by negative 2? Well, how about if I just do negative 1 third x times negative 1 half? That's much easier. Uh, and same for this negative 2 thirds times negative one-half. That makes it easier to multiply straight across. So y equals negative times negative is positive. One times one is one. Two times three is six. That's one-sixth x. The twos cancel each other. In this case, we get plus, right, negative times negative, plus one over three. So what's the slope? It's this guy right here, one-sixth. What is the y-intercept? It's this guy right here, one-third. Plot the points. Let's do that first. We'll just ask us to plot the points, so I'll just get that taken care of. Um, what was that? It was 2, negative 5, not 2, 5. Uh, let's undo that. There we go. 2, negative 5. All right. I don't even have to draft the line. It just says find the slope of the line that passes through those points. Okay. I'll go ahead and graph the line. I don't have to. It just says, if there were a line, basically, that passes through those two points, find the slope. What's the slope? It is the rise over the run. It is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's the rise. That's positive. I went up. That's positive. And go over 3, 8 thirds. There it is. I should have left you an answer line. I don't know why I didn't. It just slipped my mind. Let's say I start at this point and I go down to this point. Will I come out with 8 thirds? I bet it will. Down 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Down 8, right? Negative, a negative move. Now I'm going to have to go left 3. That's a negative as well. What's negative divided by negative? It is positive, 8 thirds. Right, either way we go. You want to do the, the 
formula y2 minus y1 equals x2 minus x1, do that. 3 minus negative 5 over 5 minus 2. 3 plus 5 is 8. 5 minus 2 is 3. Do it the other way. Negative 5 minus 3 over negative, or sorry, over 2 uh, minus 5. We get negative 5 minus 3 is negative 8. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. And we get 8 thirds. All right, four different ways to get 8 thirds. All right, so this is function notation. And now my thing is all winging out. OK, so this is the function. It just means it's named h, and x is the input. All right, this means y. It means output. This is the output of the function. All right, the output of the h function. But if I were to graph it, I would still graph whatever like this side equals. That equals y. That's what I would graph as my y value. All right. So find h or find x when h of x equals 24. Let, let's start with b. I think maybe b. I yeah. I, I think let's start with b. So h of negative one fourth. Notice h of x is how it's written. And look down here. What's here where x used to be negative one fourth. What does that mean? It means I want you to plug in negative one fourth for x. I right? never replaced x with negative one fourth. I want you to do the same. So, so h of negative one fourth equals negative four times negative one fourth plus sixteen equals. Okay, that's over one now. So uh, what I get negative four times negative one that's four over four plus sixteen. That's a one plus sixteen. That's seventeen. B is 17. Now we go to A. Okay, now, does that say H of 24? Does it have a 24 in place of X? No, it's on the other side. All right, let me show you something here. Uh, negative 4X plus 16, that's H of X, correct? Yes, H of X equals, you know, I just put it on the other side. They're still equal. Well, look here. Look what this says. This says H of X is 24. This equals H of X. H of X equals 24, okay? So this must be equal to 24. So this is really just saying the output is 24. So the, here we're saying what the input is, figure out what the output is. Here we're saying the output is this, figure out what the input was. So we don't need a middleman here to connect these anymore. These two guys can just uh, you know, move, move closer together, which I would love to do. I'm going to keep doing that instead. Equals piece by piece. I hope you fast forwarded through that. Uh, so we just solve for x. Uh, subtract 16 from both sides. Negative 4x equals uh, 24 minus 16. That's 8. Divide by negative 4 on both sides. x equals negative 2. What does that mean? It means x is negative 2. It means what if I plug in negative 2 for x? Guess what happens? Negative 4 times negative 2 plus 16. That's 8 plus 16, that's 24. Oh, what a surprise, right? That's what we told the output to be when we found x is negative 2. So if x is negative 2, the output is 24. Right? That's what's going on with that. Um, we're going to graph this function, OK? Now, um, I'd like to say I did this on purpose, and it was really tricky, but uh, I neglected to notice that the y-intercept of 9 is up here. Some of you just count it up to 9 and use that as a y-intercept. That's great. Others of you did a pretty ingenious thing and said, well, I don't have a y-intercept, but I know what a graph is. A graph is a bunch of points. Each point represents an input and an output. So why don't I just, you know, I, I kind of know that it has a, a, a positive slope. If I start up here and have a positive slope, my line should also be somewhere in here. So maybe I'll plug in, like, uh, or if I want my output to be somewhere down here with 5, well, here's 9. I'm going to have to subtract something off, which means I have to plug in a negative for x, right? But however you were thinking of it. Uh, I just need a couple of points. So 2 times negative 3, let's say. Let's say we're, we're working with negative 3. What happens when I plug that in for x? Well, that's negative 6 plus 9. That's 3. Okay, negative 3 gives me an output of 3. Now I have a point that is within this window, and maybe I know about slope, and I know that 2 over 1 is my slope, so I go up 2 and over 1, I have my line. Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't realize that the slope is 2, though it would be really great if you get on board with that. But if you don't, let's say, okay, I, I know that point, maybe uh, I'll try negative 2. I'll plug in negative 2. 
2 times negative 2, that's 9, that's uh, negative 4, so that's 9, that's 5. So negative 2 in for my x gives me a 5 out for y, of course. That's exactly what the person who used the slope of 2 got. All right, next page. So find f of negative 1 third. This is the same as a few questions ago when we were asked to plug in something for x. It's just this is in place for x, so let's plug it in for x. 3 take negative 1 third minus 12. 3 times negative 1 third, that's 3 over 1. 3's cancel. Now we have a 1. We have a 1, but it's negative, so we get negative 1 minus 12, negative 13. That's what it is. Okay, solve the equation. Nobody really had any trouble with this. We add 6 to both sides. M is 24. Okay. This one. Wow, I was, I was surprised at how much trouble we were having. So let's go through this here. Right, let's, um... Okay, we got x over 5, and it's negative, right? Equals 15. Let's do it in pieces, and then let's do it all together. Okay, I don't like that this side is negative. How can I make this not negative? How do I multiply it by a negative 1? I multiply this by a negative 1 as well. I have to do the same thing to both sides. All right, so negative 1 times negative x over 5 is positive x over 5. And that equals negative 15. There, that's a little bit better. Now I can think about what to do about this 5 in the denominator. All right. What do I do about that? How do I cancel out that 5? Well, if I multiply by 5 over 1, I multiply this by 5 over 1, uh, this is the same as 5 over 5 times x over 1. 5 over 5 divides itself, and we get, we, we get left with x. On the other side, uh, let's see this. F um, sorry, that's 5 over 1. Uh, and negative 15 times 5 is negative 75. So x is negative 75. All right, so that's one way to go. Uh, let's start over again. And say I recognize both of those things at the same time. I want to go to a positive. I don't want it to be negative anymore, so I need to multiply by a negative. And I will make that thing a negative 5. OK? Negative 5 over 1. Um, so negative 5 times negative x over 5. I know that's going to be positive. Uh, 5 divided by 5 is 1, so I now have a positive x over here. I'm going to multiply this by a negative 5 and get negative 7. Negative 75. Uh, solve the equation, check your solution. OK, so I have a 2 thirds x equals 30. Okay, it's really helpful when we're, we're solving algebraic equations. What do I want to do? I want to get a 1x here. A 1x plus 0 divided by 1. See how all these things, they don't affect x. They don't change the identity of x. They leave x. Oh, well, 1 times x is x. You add 0 to that, it's still x. You divide that by 1, it's still x. We want to cancel, quote, cancel everything until we have a 1 times an x and nothing added or nothing subtracted. Okay. So how do I cancel out this 2 thirds? I multiply it by 3 halves. I get 6 over 6. 6 divided by 6 is 1. I get 1x. So 6 over 6 times x is 1 times x. So over here, I will multiply this by also 3 halves, the reciprocal of 2 thirds. 2 cancels with 30. That leaves us with 15. 15 times 3 is 45. x is 45. Okay. Um, this equation here, um, I would, would say my suggestion would be always think if I'm tempted to divide by 10, do that last, last step. Do it the last step, OK? Just save it till the end. So first, I'll subtract 2. 10x equals 70. Divide by 10 on both sides. x equals 7. Now I can go into detail as to why we save that for the last. But hey, let's keep it simple, though it, it, it hurts the mathematician and me a little bit. Let me just help you out. Leave the dividing the, by this number that's in front of x. It's multiplied by x. Leave it for the last step, OK? Um, most of the time. That's a good rule of thumb. The problem with rules of thumb is they're called rules of thumb for some, I don't know why they're called rules of thumb. But they're called rules of thumb to say, 
well, this doesn't really apply every time, but it's a pretty good rule to, to, to go by, okay? So leave it for the end. Uh, if you want to just plain and simple, you don't want to try too hard to think about it and, and understand the deep meanings of uh, the operations and all that, whatever, save that for the last thing, all right? Same thing here. If I have a two-thirds x, before I cancel out this two-thirds, I'm going to make sure that everything else is taken care of and that two-thirds x is the last thing I deal with. What I mean by that is if I had like 2 thirds x plus 5 on this side, I would leave 2 thirds x to the last and deal with the 5 first. Okay, just the reverse order of operations. Here's an example, right? Here's a 3 fifteenths y. I'm not going to multiply by 15 over 3, okay? I'm going to just leave it. I'm going to deal with the 15 first. So I'm going to subtract 15, subtract 15. 3 fifteenths y equals negative 15. All right, so now I'm going to cancel out that 3 fifteenths, okay? That's what I'm going to do now. Multiply by 15 over 3, because the 3's cancel, the 15's cancel, or if looked at a different way, 45 over 45 is 1, and we're left with y on this side. So we'll multiply this guy by 15 over 3 as well. Okay, 15 cancel the, I don't know why I just crossed that out, that's silly. What I meant to do, well, actually, this 3 could cancel with this 15 or this 15. We could have canceled the 3 and 15 over here, made it 1 fifth, uh, whatever you like. So this is just the number 5. Okay. And negative 15 times 5 is negative 75, I believe. So uh, we get the same answer as we got for another one. Um, next, we have this, uh, this formula here. Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths times Celsius plus 32. Okay, let's read the question carefully. I think most of you did. Uh, what temperature Celsius is equal to a body temperature of 98.6? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is 98.6. So 98.6 equals 9 fifths, excuse me. 9 fifths times C, the thing that I want to solve for, plus 32. Okay, remember to deal with this 9 fifths times C later at the very end. Let's subtract 32 to begin with. Okay, so uh, we'll go down here. 98.6 minus 32 is going to be a, a 6 and 5, 56.6. What am I doing? This is going to be a 6. 66.6, uh, right, okay, um, equals 9 fifths C. I'm going to cancel out this 9 fifths. Maybe you're thinking I'll divide by 9 fifths. Well, certainly that does do exactly what you want it to do. And to make it easier on this side, when you divide by 9 fifths, it's easier to multiply by the reciprocal, so we'll multiply by 5 ninths. Okay, so what do we get when we multiply 5 ninths times 66.6, because that's all that's left, and then we'll have C all by itself. That comes out to 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. All right, so write a word problem in which the solution requires you to write and solve the equation 3x plus 28. I got some interesting um, answers here. Um, what I think in terms of is like, this guy right here, if I'm multiplying something times x, it, it's something that happens uh, you know, every time x changes, every time x goes up by 1, this, change, you know, I, I, this changes by 3. I get 3 more of whatever every time x goes up by 1. And the problem doesn't really have to make all that much sense, right? I could say that uh, this is like uh, three, $3 an hour, okay? $3 per hour. And every time uh, an hour goes by, three more dollars is added on, right? If five hours goes by, that's a total of fifteen dollars, okay? Now, what goes up at three dollars an hour? Uh, I don't know. I, I hope I'm not making three dollars an hour. Or maybe uh, you're a, a babysitter and you have uh, several kids, you know, like a daycare situation. Some daycares charge things like three dollars an hour per kid because they have several kids there at the same time. I, I don't know. But it doesn't have to make all that much sense, okay? But it does have to... Um, make, well, I guess it doesn't have to be that realistic. It does have to make sense, but it doesn't have to be that realistic. All right. So I could say I started with $28. If I had 
eight dollars to start with and made three dollars per hour uh, and at the end I had three hundred and seven dollars how many hours did I work Um, we could do it that way. Um, let's see. You just, I started at $28 and somebody uh, bought things from me at $3 per, um, per unit. Like I was selling little things that I made, right? Little paper cranes. I folded a bunch of paper cranes and I was selling them at $3 a piece. Um, and I made three hundred seven dollars. How many paper cranes did I sell? Right, that's the kind of thing that I was thinking. Some of you wrote some pretty interesting ones. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Um, think about like we we have a beginning point. We start with something. We are adding something. Okay, three times x. Think of this. This is a very important concept in linear functions. This is like a a rate. Right, three dollars an hour. Three dollars a unit. Uh, three miles an hour, three miles per gallon. Uh, it's a rate of change. Every time x changes, uh, the output of, of this part of the function goes up by three, up by three, up by three, up by three. Okay. So anything like that was good. Some of you had some good ones. Some of you had stuff a little bit backwards. Um, that's fine. We're, we're still thinking about this. Uh, we're going to solve the equation, okay, on, I always like to collect like terms first, so I'm going to just go 2x, I'm just going to go 2x plus 30, right, 15 and 15, they're here together on the same side, they're both positive, we add them together, okay. Um, you could do, we could do this so many different ways, but uh, this is the way that, that I do it, I just collect like terms, now it looks more, quote, normal, okay, you got it x term, I got a, a constant equals some constant. So I'm going to uh, subtract 30 from both sides. I get 2x equals negative 34. x, when I divide by 2 on both sides, equals negative uh, 17. Negative 17. Okay. I, if I wanted to, I could subtract 15 from both sides, subtract 15 from both sides again, then collect like terms. And we, I saw so many different varieties of, uh, of, of which our approaches were. Um, plenty of fine ones, plenty of uh, definitely kind of feeling lost and confused approaches. So if you're at a loss, you know, try just collecting like terms. If possible, if it's not possible, then skip this, right? Then uh, try and like add and subtract the constant. Right? If you collect like terms first, then you won't have any like terms to collect, it'll all be done, and then you'll just have at most a, a variable thing here, and then a constant on the side with the, with this variable here. Uh, so we'll add or subtract whatever that is, and, and quote move it to the other side, and then you know divide, or maybe what's more appropriate is to uh, multiply by the reciprocal of some fraction. Okay, cancel out that thing that's in front of the x, and then we'll be done. Now, the thing that I don't like about steps is that this is not going to work all the time. How can I collect like terms if uh, there's something to distribute? Oh, okay, well, maybe the step before that should be distribute. Well, what if I don't have to distribute that thing? What if I could just divide it out, which I will show you in, uh, in a couple of problems from now? Well, okay, okay, you could do that, right? I don't like these steps because they do not necessarily always work, and they're not always, they're hardly always the way to do it, like the only way to do it. But this will help you solve lots and lots of linear equations, but not all of them, okay? Steps are not the end-all be-all. Um, you gotta think about it. Think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to get x by itself. What is in the way of that? Well, this 30 is in the way. I could subtract 30. 20, 2x plus 30 minus 30 is just 2x, right? Because 30 minus 30 is 0. 2x plus 0 is 2x. Okay, now we're on to this one. 
Uh, keep running to solve for x. If I solve for x, then I get x equals something with x in it. That's not that helpful. I need to be told what x is. What is x worth? So first I like to, still it's like collecting like terms, but the, the terms are on this side. I can't do 5x plus x, right? Because they're not on the same side. I need to um, have x's all on this side. I need to cancel out the x's on this side, if you like to think of it as a scale. Right, like this, okay? Pretend that means it's balanced, even though it looks crooked. We got uh, 5x, okay? So let's just call it blob is 5, and or just blob is x. We got x is blobs here. We got five of them there, and uh, we got two nice uh, coins over here, and here we have a blob, that's x, and then we have seven coins. Okay, so how much is one of those blobs worth? Well, it sure is confusing to have blobs on both sides, so I'm gonna just get rid of this blob over here. Well, that's, that's making this side heavier, right? But if I take off a blob, they're all the blobs are the exact same weight. So now, okay, now it's all even again. Well, I'm close, but I, I got these coins on this side. This, let's get rid of that. Yeah, get rid of those guys there. Get rid of two on that side. What have we done so far? Let's just see. We took a bag off of this side, and we took a bag off of this side as well. We got 4x plus 2 equals 7. Then we took the two coins off of this side and two coins off of this side. Got to keep it level. Got to keep it balanced, right? So we took two from both sides. Now we have 4x equals 5. Now here's the problem. It's very tricky to take this analogy, okay, and figure out how much one of these things is. Here's why it's tricky. We just want to know what one of these is, right? And there's four groups of these one things. So I just want to look at like one fourth of of this side. I want to know what one fourth of this side is worth because one fourth of this side is one of these blobs. So if I just try to cut this into four, well, it seems like it works pretty well. I'm cut this into four pieces, uh, but then there's this guy, right? So then I have to cut that one piece into four pieces, okay? So one-fourth of this side is, is one of these and one of these little guys, right? One and one-fourth, okay? Or five-fourths, which I like to say, okay? Because getting wrapped up in writing it as a mixed number, um, it's, it's good to know because I want to know how much it is, where does it lay on the number line, how many coins, how many gallons, how many whatevers is it. Um, but it's perfectly fine to leave it as 5 fourths because it's the exact same thing. So what do we do in this, like what, what are the symbols doing? Well, we're just going to look at 1 fourth of this side. We're going to look at one of these x's, right? We divide by 4 on both sides. x equals 5 fourths. I don't know why I wrote it over there because the answer line's over here. Negative 5, or not negative, x is 5 fourths. Look at one fourth of each side. One fourth of this side is one blob. That's why we're looking at one fourth of, of both sides because we want to look at one blob and there's four blobs over here. So we divide by four, and we divide this side by four, and we get five fourths. One fourth, two, three, four, five fourths. Okay, next. All right, what do we do here? I would like to collect like terms, right? I would like to do step number one, but I can't collect like terms because this term n is inside of parentheses. To get it out of the parentheses, you know, break it out of jail or whatever kind of silly thing we might say uh, that's not at all true because this isn't a jail, it's a set of parentheses, uh, we would need to deal with the parentheses. Why are the parentheses there? What's happening to the parentheses? The parentheses are being raised to an exponent? No, they're not being raised to an exponent. They're divided? No, they're not divided by something. They are being multiplied by the parentheses. The entire everything in the parentheses is being multiplied by negative 2. So we need to make that happen. Make everything in the parentheses get multiplied by negative 2. Okay? So negative 2n plus 4. Plus 4. Very important. Some of you just kind of missed that, spaced it out. That's fine. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Now I can like, collect like terms. 5, 2, 5n minus 2n is 3n. 4 equals uh, negative 11. I will subtract 4 from both sides. Careful here. Negative 11 minus 4, just take it easy. Take it slow. Negative 15, okay? It's not like positive uh, uh, 7 or negative 7. And make sure that you're just keeping your head on straight. Just take it slow. I think those kinds of mistakes are just because you're going too fast. Negative, or so 3n, divide by 3, divide by 3 n is negative 5. Yeah. Um, 
this one oh, is kind of crazy. What, what do I do? I'll, I'll just look at the left side. I'll collect like terms on the left side. Negative 14x, uh, negative 29. Oh, that's the only uh, constant on that side. Equals, okay. Should I do the three deposited, you know, distributed into the, the parentheses? No, re just read it to yourself. What does it say? Three minus, did you say times? No, you did not say times. Three times the parentheses? No, three minus the parentheses. So three t is not multiplied by the parentheses, so we don't distribute it. Right? It's three minus 12 plus 2x. How do I subtract 12 plus 2x? Well, I subtract 12 and I subtract 2x. I distribute the negative. Minus 12, minus 2x. Okay. Uh, I'm going to collect like terms over on the other side now. 14, negative 14x minus 29 equals negative 9 minus 2x. All right. It's, I, I would love to draw a picture for you with the, the scales and all that kind of stuff, but it's very difficult to imagine all these negatives, what they would look like. Negative blobs and negative coins that have to be floating or a different color. and um, That's why we graduate to using symbols. Uh, but what do I want to do? I want to not have x terms on this side. What's, what would eliminate this negative 2x? What if I added 2x? Well, if I subtract 2x and I add 2x, it's like I did nothing. They, they're just canceling each other out. They are eliminating each other. This is 0. Negative 9 plus 0. So we do the same thing on the other side. Negative 12x minus 29 equals negative 9. Add 29 to both sides, leaving the dividing to last to the very end. Negative 12x equals positive 20. Divide by negative 12. x equals negative 20 over 12. These both have a common factor of 4. Negative, uh, this is not what I write. I wrote what I was thinking, not what I should have written. They have a common factor of 4, so that leaves a 5 and a 3. Negative 5 thirds. Right, onward. Uh, I was very impressed with this problem. I, I'm, I'm learning something about maybe how the, the teenage brain works. When you see the equation, you can reason out how it would apply, like which of these equations would apply to the situation. So uh, I'll briefly explain it, but I, I think you guys are on board. Um, um, Michelle wants to earn $900. She wants to earn $900. It certainly seems that these being all equal to $900 makes a lot of sense. Like when the day is over, she counts up all her money. She would like it to equal $900. So that makes sense. Selling 22 knit scarves. Okay. She wants to sell each scarf for $4. Why would she want to sell it for $4 less? She wants to beat the competition. She wants to uh, have pull people over to, to her uh, table and have them buy things from her. Um, $4 less than her competitor. If x is the price charged for a competitor, what equation models the situation? Okay, well, I'm thinking like if I were to, if I were to just sell 22 scarves and I had earned $900, well, 22 times the number of scarves, the scarves, they're just scarves, like with roofs. It's, it's not roofs. Right, it's 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 roofs, roofs. But it's scarves, uh, scarf and scarves, knife and knives. But it's roofs. I don't know. I thought I was talking with my wife about that the other day. Twenty-two times the number of scarves gives me nine hundred dollars. Um, oh no, twenty-two scarves. Twenty-two. Excuse me, please. Twenty-two scarves times the number of dollars per scarf dollars per scarf. Well, I don't know what she wants to sell them for. She doesn't even want to sell them for X. Her competitor is selling them for X. She wants to sell them for X minus $4. So we take that, multiply it by 22. 22 times $4 less than the competitor. She wants to come out with $900. Okay. Doesn't ask us to solve it. Just asks us which equation works. It's this guy right here. 22 scarves times a, a dollar amount that's four less than her competitor. She gets $900. That's the equation we would use. All right, so here is an example of when just following the steps, collect like terms. Uh, add or subtract the constant and divide by the coefficient of x. Does not, it's not the smartest way, it's not the quickest way to do this, right? In this case, we have the desire to, to figure out what x minus 4 is equal to. Um, so, 
First, let's do it the long way, all right? The way that fits the steps, the steps that we would most often follow. So we distribute the four. You see the parentheses and so many times the parentheses we distribute. We get 20 equals 4x minus 16. We add 16, we get 36 equals 4x. We divide by 4, we get x equals 9. Okay, but I don't want x. I want x minus 4, so simple enough. We'll subtract 4 from both sides. This side is what? x minus 4, right? That's what I get when I subtract 4 from x. And this side is 5. So x minus 4 is 5. I did it. Okay, but we don't have to do that. That doesn't have to be our life. We can uh, do this a little, a little bit more quickly. Okay, we have 20 equals 4 times x minus 4. I would like to get what is x minus 4 equal to. Well, look at that. What, what is this? This is x minus 4. How can I get that by itself and therefore on the other side, whatever is over there, that's what x minus 4 will be equal to. Well, I could just divide the 4. And you say, you said to leave that till last. You said to, to leave the dividing till last. And that's why I also said I don't love steps. I don't love uh, you know, rules of thumb because then I try to show you a, a faster, quicker way, a sleeker, uh, more elegant way, and it, it, you get confused, okay? Um, so don't get wrapped up in, in rules and steps and uh, things like that too much. 20 divided by 4 is 5. What's on the other side? Well, I just canceled out this 4 because 4 divided by 4 is 1, and x minus 4 is 5, okay? Also, if I were to solve this equation, just solve for x, that's what I would have done as well. I would have divided by 4. Why would I distribute the 4 only to later divide by 4 again? Right? I just undid what I did in the first step. So, um, But then again, the only reason I would divide by 4 is because 20 is divisible by 4. If it weren't, then that wouldn't be the best first step to take. All right? So and, and those, are the only kinds, those are the kinds of things that only come with practice and time and dedication. Um, and being okay with being confused, being okay with uh, it taking you five or ten minutes to work through what sim seems like a simple problem that your buddy can do in three seconds. Um, it's okay. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to feel frustrated. Um, just sit in it. Be okay with it. Um, and, and work through it. Uh, but don't work through it in such a way as like, I wish I was done with this and I wish I knew how to do this. And, to say, what do I want to do? What, what will get me there? I'll be done now. I'll be done being on my soapbox. I think that's the last question. It is the last question. Okay? So please uh, be patient. Be okay with being wrong. Um, have faith in yourself that you will figure it out. You will understand it. You may be confused now, but you will not allow yourself to be confused forever. And maybe that takes coming in and talking with me. Maybe that takes uh, calling up your your uncle who's really great at math. That's what I did uh, when I was in high school. Um, but make it happen. Ask me anything. Uh, come in anytime, and I would love to help you. Uh, thanks for watching this. Thanks for taking that time, and I hope it was helpful.